OK, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. Um, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst uh, at Google in Switzerland. And part of what I do is talk with webmasters like you to help answer your questions and make sure that information flows both directions as well. Um, I have a bit of a call today, so I don't know if we'll do the full hour, but uh, we'll see how far we can go. Otherwise, you'll have to resort to asking me yes or no questions. I don't know if that works. We'll see. Um, do any of you want to get started? Uh, I'll take a shot since uh, nobody else wants to. Uh, it is actually a penguin question. Uh, since you said that you're, uh, you're not currently refreshing uh, monthly or very regularly, but you plan to do that, uh, is it fair to say that there has been no refreshes of data for Penguin this year? I don't know. It's possible. I, I don't know the, the specific dates. So okay. I, I think that might be correct, but I can't confirm it 100%. Uh, so on the next refresh, will you be able to announce it, or might it just go? Uh, um, I don't think we'd pre-announce it, but uh, if this is something bigger that happens that people have been waiting for, we will try to confirm it. That definitely. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, we have locations page with lots of locations. Uh, it loads with Ajax. How do we mark it up? I took a quick look at this page, and it looks really nice. But a lot of the JavaScript files are blocked by robots.txt. So we can't actually see any of the markup that you're generating there with uh, Ajax. You can test that with Fetch's Google and Webmaster Tools, and you'll see which script files are blocked so that you can kind of go through that individually and, and clean that up. Uh, once we can crawl the page normally, we can render it normally, and then we can pick up the markup, even if you're embedding it with uh, JavaScript. Uh, what's the best route to go TLD across countries, um, folders, or whatever? Which uh, variation should I put my X default tag on? Um, essentially, for geotargeting, for country language targeting, you can pick whichever option works best for you. So if you prefer to use a generic top-level domain and folders or subdomains, sub that's essentially up to you. That's whatever works best for you on your side. Uh, your X default is also up to you. So if you decide that you want uh, what's the, the French version to as the default, country, that will be fine. Um, folder. Oop. Hold on. Let me mute you. Sorry, John. Can you repeat that again? Um, so the X default is, is also up to you. If you want your French version as a default, that's fine. If you prefer your English version as the X default, that's fine, too. That's essentially how you, however you want to be seen by people that you're not specifically targeting within your existing uh, hreflang sets. So the reason why um, the reason why I've asked that question is because if you put it in directories and com is our main site basically. Um, mm -hmm. Oh man, I think you got muted somehow accidentally. Hello. <laughs> Try again. Yes. Okay. What's going on? Um, maybe ask again. Okay, there we go. Um, so the reason why I asked that question is because what if um, .com is our main TLD, right? And would it be better than to have it in directories making com the main authority rather than having them across different TLDs? It's essentially up to you. It, you can use different TLDs if you prefer, or if there are legal reasons, maybe you need to do that. But essentially, it's it's up to you. And from a ranking point of view, we, we will treat these equivalently if we have the right uh, geo-targeting information for those individual versions. So that's not something where I'd say you need to use country code top-level domains or you need to use generic with subdomains or with subdirectories. That's 
essentially whatever works best for you. Maybe there are legal reasons to go with one or the other. Maybe there are just practical reasons that you have a CMS that doesn't support different subdirectories. Maybe you'd want to put it on different subdomains or on different domains completely. But uh, that's essentially however you want to handle it. OK. And then obviously, you know, doing it across the LDs, one would then have to get HDFLang implemented properly, right? Yeah, I mean, if you, regardless of how you set that up, I make up make sure that you have the hreflang set up between the different versions, um, even if it's on the same TLD. So, okay. hreflang works everywhere. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, John, if I can uh, do a, a small follow up, uh, the reason uh, a lot of webmasters are asking this and SEOs is because the, the uh, sometimes we're afraid that using separate TLDs, separate domains, uh, might uh, increase the work that they need to do to get some exposure to their uh, domain, so Google uh, ranks the domain better, rather than having subdomain and subfolders where everything is consolidated into a single domain. Would hreflang work uh, somewhat like a command call, so all the Google sees all these different domains as part of the same Entity is the same website, and uh, uh, you know ranking signals towards one domain might also influence the other domains since Google uh, sees the Ashraf tank uh, and applies them together, or is it not the case? A little bit, but not not like you would have with like a rel canonical, because then we can really fold everything together. And we need to be kind of careful that we don't run into the situation where uh, one really strong company in one location, for example, suddenly ranks number one everywhere just because they're very strong in one location. So if you take a really big, let's say, American distributor, and they're really big in the US because everyone goes there, just because they open up a store in Italy doesn't mean that that store in Italy is suddenly going to be number one in Italy just because they're number one in the US. So some amount of kind of crosstalk always happens there, but it's it's something we do try to look at on an, on an individual basis. So it's not that like the, the strength from one version automatically goes into the other one. Um, the, the issue with separate TLDs or separate folders, I think, is something where you kind of have to think about how, how much content you actually have in those individual languages or in different locations. So it's not something where I'd say um, you can create country-specific versions for all the countries out there, and Google will just rank it as local content automatically, because we, we do expect that this content is somehow specific to that area. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to balance between being able to target these individual countries and languages, but uh, at the same time holding yourself back from spamming and kind of diluting your content across all of these different languages. So sometimes it makes sense to, to broaden that. Sometimes it makes sense to concentrate more and say, OK, I'll limit myself to two or three countries, and people outside of those countries will still be able to find my content. But I know that the content for these countries is really, really strong because I've been able to focus my energy on it. I have great content that matches there. This is great stuff for ranking. So there's no automatic answer between splitting things up and concentrating, you kind of have to look at what you have available and what, where you want to go, what you want to do. Right. I was mainly referring to if you did decide to split up between a few countries where it makes sense to, whether uh, going separate TLDs uh, and uh, separate subfolders, but geolocating those subfolders or subdomains, would it be fairly equivalent? Or because we're on the same domain with the subfolders and subdomains, Google will uh, uh, or it would matter that uh, there's a single domain rather than, you know, separate domains, multiple websites. I suspect there might be some small kind of factor involved there, but it's not something that, that I'd really worry about from a practical point of view. Like, if you have strong preferences internally for one or the other variation, I, I just go with that. I. Like, like I said, I kind of caution away from just splitting things up uh, just for the sake of splitting it up. But if you prefer TLDs, fine. If you prefer having everything on one domain, that's fine, too. OK. 
Um, maybe I can give you some background, John. Um, we actually had it all on one domain and added the countries with different languages into directories. Um, since we launched our new site, we then moved to um, TLDs, and our, our traffic has dropped by half for the past year. Um, I mean, all the 301 redirects was done correctly, page by page, not you know just from domain to domain or directory to domain. Um, but I mean, monitoring over the past year, it's just dropping and dropping. You know, it's it's actually not having a benefit to us. Yeah, I would expect that that wouldn't be related to that. So no. anytime you you make a move like that, when you split up a site or you concentrate a site, you will see some fluctuations. It's not not always smooth sailing because we can't take all of the signals and just like transfer them immediately, like we could with a site move if you're splitting things up. But uh, if you're looking at a period of over a half a year, then I suspect that these are just normal fluctuations, normal changes in the way that uh, things are evolving in search around that market. So you wouldn't suggest we go back to that, uh, having it in direct case again, so that it already moves a lot, uh, you know, over a year ago? I, I wouldn't go back just for that. I, I'd really kind of think about what what else might be happening there outside of just like the, the SEO side of things. Sure. And that's kind of where I'd focus and kind of uh, try to put more weight on that. I don't think switching something like that back will have any significant effect. Okay. Thank you. All right. How important is it to have a mobile site versus an app? We notice a lot of e-commerce sites these days are now moving to apps instead of a mobile sites. How does Google treat these sites? Um, this is always an interesting question, but I think so. So on the one hand, we we are being are able to kind of understand how apps work more and more, especially Android apps. We're able to use them for app indexing which means we can kind of crawl the app content, and we can tie that together with your web content, which might be desktop content, and we can show links directly to your app content in search instead of to your desktop pages, for example. And that can be a really good user experience. So if you're searching for specific, I don't know, blue shoes, and you find your favorite distributor in there with an app deep link to their app, to their app's page on blue shoes, then that can be a really good user experience. So that's something that could make a lot of sense. On the other hand, if you have apps, you need to keep in mind that they're very platform specific. Um, if you make an Android app and you don't have an iPhone app, then users on an iPhone are not going to be that happy with uh, just the desktop pages. So my recommendation would generally be to make sure that you always have a mobile-friendly website. And if you want to go a step further and also kind of uh, provide an app for your pages, then by, by all means, take that step and go, that, go down that road. Uh, if you want to tie that into your website, I definitely take a look at the app indexing uh, functionality. That's something I suspect will just gain more on prominence over years or over the near future. So that's something where if you're already working on an app, you already have a website, you can tie those in together, and that'll make them a little bit easier for us to show appropriately in search directly. Hey, John. Hi. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question on sort of mobile rankings? Um, sure. I know a couple of years ago, um, it was the advice of Google that response was better compared to like an m.domain.com. Is it now the case that either of them can rank equally as well? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, in our documentation, we have three different variations. Uh, the M dot, so separate URLs, responsive sites, and also dynamic serving, where you use the same URLs and you just serve the content dynamically depending on the device. And all three of those, if they're implemented properly, are perfectly fine from our point of view. And not something where I'd say you need to go to a responsive to get a ranking benefit. From our point of view, they're essentially equivalent. For users, they click on the result, they land on a mobile-friendly page, and that's essentially what we're looking for. We're not looking for promoting any specific technology. It just should work well on a mobile device. OK, thanks. 
Um, one of my clients was hit by Panda after copying his old articles to LinkedIn. Is it possible to be hit even if your original article was posted on your blog before posting it to stronger websites? Uh, can't use a canonical on LinkedIn. So in general, the Panda algorithm is a quality algorithm that we run, which tries to promote higher quality content which looks at a variety of factors around content quality, around the content. So just by copying an individual article to another website and publishing it there, that's unlikely to, to kind of upset our algorithms. That's something where, in general, when we look at a website, we kind of try to understand the quality of this website, and we look at everything around this website. So that's just by copying one article over to another site, that's not going to affect that. So my recommendation there would be to not worry so much about this specific thing that was happening there, but really to take a step back and look at the quality of the website overall. And maybe um, find some people who aren't associated with your website who can give you a little bit more insight as well about what, what kind of might be happening there or how they feel about your website when they come to it for the first time, when they see it for the first time, how they navigate within the website, how trustworthy they feel this website is, if this is something that they give the credit card number out to. So these are the kind of things where you'd want to have someone give you really hard feedback about your website and things that you probably don't want to hear directly because someone might be criticizing something that you've been working on for years, but I think a lot of times it's really important to get this kind of neutral feedback, even if it's harsh, even if it means that you have to kind of rethink your, your whole model. So from that point of view, I wouldn't focus so much about this individual article that got copied to LinkedIn, but rather think about how your website interacts with users overall, how they feel about it when they go there, and maybe do some user studies, maybe find some people who aren't associated with your website who can give you a little bit more help. OK, uh, we syndicate some of our products to third-party websites, uh, for example, affiliates, aggregator deal sites, all linked back to our site with rel nofollow. An SEO guru said this could give us a penalty despite the nofollow. Uh, is that true? That's not true. So if these links are there with a nofollow, then we drop them from our link graph. That's as simple as that. So it's not something that you'd have to worry about there. And links from those kind of sites with a nofollow is perfectly fine. They drive traffic to your website. They make it possible for people to go to your business to buy these things that you're offering. And that's, that's perfectly fine. That's a good use of a nofollow. So from that point of view, that's absolutely not a problem. Um, if I have a paginated list and change the default sort order but keep the same URL, does that matter? Um, the tricky part here is we'll crawl it in one variation and we'll kind of look at that variation so we can't see how you're changing the sort order for users. And if we can find all the individual items that are linked from there, then that's perfectly fine. If we can't find them unless someone does, does the right step of clicks and kind of gets the right cookie, the right setting to actually get that uh, collection of links, and that's more of a problem. But if this is something we can still crawl through, we can find all of your content, that's fine. John, can I step in with a follow-up on this? Sure. How about the secondary, tertiary pages, and so on and so forth? If those pages contain a no-index tag, I mean, you still see all the products, OK, which mm -hmm. maybe they can be thousands. Mm -hmm. Those specific pages have a no index. How do you treat those products on those pages? I mean, they do have, they have no index follow. Yeah. So we follow the links. We, we crawl them. We don't index those pages, but we follow the links. That means you own index <laughs> even the products, is, of course. Well, if it has a no index, you're telling us not not to index it, so yeah. Yeah, then it makes sense that those pages have rel prev, rel next, have the pagination if they are no indexed. Um, if they're no indexed, I 
don't think it really makes sense to do like the rel previous and next. At least not not for Google. But at the same time, we we'd probably just ignore it there. So it's not that you would cause any problems if you're using rel next and previous for other reasons and maybe keep them there. But at least from from Google's point of view, if we can't index them, then we can't kind of take them as a, a collection of pages about this topic. I understand. So if we drop the no index, then the rel prevent next, the pagination would make would make perfect sense, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, John, would you recommend uh, the rel prev next tags over no indexing uh, page two, three, four of a category? Because a lot of CMSs kind of no index these these pages automatically, even you know uh, the WordPress SEO by Yoast plugin gives you this option, although not in the back end. So, would you recommend the rel prev next and uh, leaving the pages to be indexed, or rather just no index? I don't have any strong preference either way. I I'd leave that up to you. I I don't think this is something where Google would say you should do it this way or that way. I can see perfectly good reasons to to say I want to no index these pages because they're not really that interesting. It might also be that there are situations where you have sites where it, this is actually useful and interesting content that makes sense to index or that makes sense to at least index as a part of a series. So it's it's kind of up to you. Okay. Um, I noticed new markup for video games. Uh, if putting this on an official site, will this directly influence the knowledge graph? Will this impact any other searches? Um, I saw this for the first time, so thanks for linking to that. That's uh, really cool. Um, the important part here, I think, is is worth to mention that this is for official sites. So if you have a fan page, if you have an affiliate page for one of these video games, and that's not really the markup that you need to use, uh, but for official sites, this is a great way to kind of give us the information that you really want to have used in the knowledge graph, in the knowledge panel on the side. So. That's something, if you have an official site for a video game, then by all means give us that information. I think there's uh, attributes like publisher name, those kind of things in there, which we do try to show in the knowledge graph. And if you can give us an authoritative source, then that's, that's even better. So that's something we will try to take into account. It doesn't apply for other searches, though. So I'm going to the other part of the question there. Uh, what's the best way to find uh, the number of pages indexed in Google? Site query shows a different number, index status, sitemap, etc. So a site query is more like a very, very, very rough number, which can sometimes be a few orders of magnitude off, so plus or minus a couple zeros at the end. And I don't think that makes it very actionable. So as an SEO, I wouldn't focus on that. Uh, the index status is essentially the correct number of pages that we have indexed, but that can be a bit misleading because it shows everything that we happen to run across and index from a website, which could include a lot of duplicate content, which could include a lot of things that you don't really care about. Personally, I prefer the sitemaps count because that's something where you can kind of um, submit the URLs that you really care about. You say, these are the URLs I actually do want to have indexed. And we'll give you information saying, well, out of this set of URLs that you submitted, this many actually are indexed at the moment. And we look at the exact URLs. So if you submit one version like with slash index HTML in the sitemap, and we index it just with slash at the end, then that's something that we wouldn't count as being indexed. But at the same time, for you, that's kind of interesting information because it tells you that maybe your sitemap file isn't completely perfect um, if you see bigger mismatches there. So I'd focus as much as possible on the sitemap count there. I really like sitemaps. John, can I ask a follow-up question, please? Sure. Um, is there any way to download a list of your indexed URLs from Webmaster Tools? I can't seem to find anything like that. It shows you how many is indexed, but if I'm missing some that are in my sitemap, can I find out which ones in my sitemap aren't indexed? No, not at the moment. So um, 
we we had that as one of the wishes kind of submitted with uh, the wish list we did earlier this year. But at the moment, that's not something that you can do directly in Webmaster Tools. What you can do is kind of um, narrow things down on your side if you want to take the time to do that. So you can submit multiple sitemap files, of course, and you can kind of separate the URLs on your site into logical sets of sitemap files where you say, well, these are all my category pages, these are all my product pages, these are all my articles, and that way you can kind of narrow things down a little bit. But it's sometimes it's a lot of manual work, um, so I don't know how useful that is to do in, in practice. Yeah, OK, thanks. John, um, regarding uh, things that get emitted from the index, is it at all possible, um, or should you, like often I'll, I'll be looking around for things that I need to fix, and um, some of the things are omitted. Is it worth fixing those things first, or other things that are currently in the index? In the index? Both, both, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, if you know about issues on your website, those are things I, I'd fix. If you know about the pages that aren't indexed yet, it might make sense to, to look about how you can kind of link to them better within your website. Um, but essentially, it's it's hard to say which which one you should concentrate on more. It really kind of depends on your, your website and where you think uh, your bigger problems are. Sometimes the, the bigger problem is that your website isn't really crawlable and that we can't index any of the content because we can't actually crawl to it. And that can be a really serious problem. But sometimes it might be that we can crawl it just fine, but uh, the content that we find there is actually not so hot. Then fixing the content would be something I'd, I'd recommend there. Sure, thanks. Uh, with Google adding mobile as a ranking factor, we have sites that average 20,000 pages, and lots of them are mobile optimized, but a few aren't. Uh, what, what's going to happen? So essentially, we're looking at this on a per page basis. So if those pages that are mobile friendly are the ones that we're showing in search, that's perfectly fine. Um, <clears throat> The ones that aren't mobile friendly are probably the ones that you want to work on. But if these are pages that nobody really sees in search, then maybe that's not so so critical. But it's not the case that the whole site will disappear on search if you have just a part of the page is mobile friendly at the moment. Uh, John, uh, hi. Yeah, I've got a question about um, uh, Panda. Uh, quality algorithms, um, let's say a site that's been around for a, a long time uh, got hit by the uh, Panda 4 or the May 2014 algorithm, and then they didn't uh, do anything uh, about it because um, they were still planning on improving the site. And then later on, the next Panda algorithm uh, uh, comes out like the September 2014, and do do these uh, in in general um, the quality control algorithm build on each other, or uh, are they uh, still just taking it uh, from where it's at? So the reason I'm asking is because like uh, I I've uh, got some old sites uh, for for clients and then. They they didn't update in a while and and you know like they got hit bad by the last panda update so should they be looking at oh we need to get working on this before the next one uh, rolls around because they they will technically build on each other uh, or do they just will the new algorithm just take the site from where it's at in uh, you know, its current relevance. Yeah. In, in general, our algorithms are looking at the current state of a website. And of course, that kind of involves things like crawling and indexing, because when we say the current state, that means the current state as we know about it. 
which means we had to kind of crawl and index and process all these signals first. And at that point, we're looking at that current state. But it's not the case that we'd say, well, a previous algorithm looked at your site a year ago and thought it was bad. Therefore, you have to do even more work than a normal website would have to do to kind of get out, that, out of that. It's essentially, if we look at the current state and we say, well, this is fine, then that's, that's a good sign. So what I was thinking about is like the, the longer term algorithms like we've seen in the uh, past uh, a, two, two years or so ago, there was a, a Panda or some update that came out which when it refreshed, it let up some sites that had been down for like a year plus. So these are like the longest of the quality control type of updates. Are these, uh, will these be more reflected by this kind of scenario so that if someone is considering rebuilding an old site, they should say, well, we haven't, there's been a few Panda updates, and we haven't worked on it for a long time, so we'd be best off starting with a new uh, URL and, and going from there. Uh, or is it not the case that uh, because the site's been a problem for quite a while that it's gotten hit by these uh, longer-term uh, problem algorithms? I I wouldn't worry about it from that point of view. I mean, if you're considering like revamping your website and making it significantly better, then that's not something where I'd say you need to move to a different URL to kind of uh, profit from that. I think users are going to respect that if you make bigger quality changes like that, and the search engines will pick up on it as well as as they kind of reprocess this data. So from that point of view, I wouldn't like artificially hold this back or artificially push it into a specific bucket, but but rather think about what you can do to kind of improve the site overall and actually go ahead and do that. All right. Thanks. OK. My Magento website automatically applies templates depending on user agent, which means uh, it means with the exact same link, mobile users see different content from desktop users. How does Google treat my website? Which version does it choose to index? Um, if you're separating between mobile and desktop users, then that's essentially dynamic serving, as we call it, where you serve content based on the device that the user is using, and that's perfectly fine. That's a legitimate strategy to create a mobile-friendly website. So from that point of view, that's that's something that sounds like you're doing the right thing there. Um, as to which version Google would index, um, in a case like that, we'd index the desktop version in general, because that's that's the main version, kind of the version that we see with the normal Googlebot. And uh, that's kind of the one that we would focus on. If you don't have a desktop version and your whole site is just mobile, then of course we'll focus on that one too. Hi, John. Uh, just want to follow up on this one. So we also providing this dynamic serving for our desktop site. So one version is showing to our Indian users and one for the US version. So I mean, the Google is always indexing as US version. I mean, that's all the time. I'm just seeing my cache or the tax version. I only see the US version, not the Indian version. So I mean, how can I make sure that my Indian version also get indexed by Google? I mean, we're just updating it regularly on a daily basis, maybe within hours. But I mean, the US version always gets called. Yeah, that's that's a good question. That's tricky. Let me just mute you for a second. There's a lot of background noise. Um, so that's kind of tricky because it's it's a difficult situation, of course. Um, our recommendation is generally to have separate URLs for the different language or, or location versions. So you would have one version for slash US and one version slash IN for India, for example. That's essentially the, the optimal situation. Then we can crawl and index both of those versions separately. Uh, if you have hreflang set up between those versions, we understand that they belong together. If you have one version that kind of like the home page that automatically redirects depending on the user's location, then you could also include that in the hreflang set as the X default page. But essentially, the important part is really that we have separate URLs for the different country versions so that we can actually crawl and index the separate versions. Because otherwise, like, like you said, we tend to crawl from the US. 
And we'll probably just see the US version, and we'll miss out on all the content you have specific for Indian users. So that's something where if you can set it up to have separate URLs, that would be the optimal solution there. Oh. Um, mobile responsive versus desktop. Could it be a problem if we hide too much content on the mobile version with display none? Uh, the UI is better if we hide it on mobile, but the difference to desktop is becoming pretty big. Um, in general, like I said, we, we do try to focus on the desktop version for crawling, uh, for indexing. So in general, we'll try to pick up on that. Our requirement is that the mobile version be essentially equivalent to the desktop version. That doesn't mean all the text is exactly the same. It doesn't mean that the, the whole UI is the same, that you have like all the links in the sidebar are the same. Um, but essentially, the primary content should be equivalent on the mobile version. And if that's the case, that's, that's perfectly fine. So you don't have to show all of the sidebar, the footers, the headers, maybe bigger images, those kind of things. Um, that's perfectly fine to kind of adapt that for mobile and not show that or limit it or to um, show a different variation of that. So a lot of sites, for example, take big images and they fold them into smaller ones or ones that you need to click on to actually see for mobile. And that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, we're seeing a lot of content mismatch errors in Webmaster Tools for Android apps. Being an e-commerce site, we end up showing different content on desktop and M site. How do we tackle this issue? Will it affect our M site ranks? Um, so this wouldn't affect how we rank your website in general. This is essentially a problem when it comes to app indexing, where you give us one URL that goes to your app and one URL that goes to your website. And we try to figure out what the primary content is on the app page as well as on the, the, on the web page and make sure that it kind of matches. So uh, for example, we're looking for if you have one page on your website about blue shoes and the equivalent mo the page on your app is about, I don't know, red socks, then that would be essentially a content mismatch. But if the equivalent page on the app is also about blue shoes but written slightly differently, then that's something where we might not be picking it up perfectly there. So if you see things like that and you think the content is actually equivalent but we're not picking up on it properly, then definitely let us know about that. Maybe post in the help forum. Give us uh, the information that we need from uh, the app specifically that you're using there so that we can follow up with you and see what exactly is going wrong there. Is there something on our side maybe that's uh, interpreting your content wrong? Or is there maybe something in the app that makes it hard for us to actually pick up that content? Uh, hi, John. I mean, I just want to follow up on this question as well. I mean, we have this site where one is desktop and one is um, separate URL, basically. So where we need to add this app indexing URL to our desktop site or to our mobile website? Um, good question. I don't know for sure. Um, I double check in the, the documentation. My Understanding is uh, that it, it needs to be tied in with the desktop site. And if you have a mobile site that's already set up as an alternate, then we kind of see that three-way connection anyway. But uh, my understanding it is it should be with the desktop site. But I really double check in the documentation first. OK, thank you. OK, um, my voice is kind of giving out. So I'll take a break here. Um, it looks like we have, still have a bunch of questions left. Um, I'll copy them out and see if I can answer some of them offline afterwards. Um, but otherwise, so far, thank you guys for, for all the questions. And uh, hope this was a useful hangout again. And maybe we'll see each other again in one of the future ones. Thank you, John. And uh, a lot of health, we wish you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, well, Bye. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Have a good weekend, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye, John.